Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Saturday Human Colony Hukalo webinar. It is Saturday, the 10th, no, the 11th of November 2018. And our special guest that we have today is known by his YouTube channel as Modern Wizard. Uh, and we also know him as uh, Radagast, and you might know him also as ModWiz if you've seen him on uh, on YouTube. But he's a very popular YouTube channel, and he's always talking about uh, things from the perspective of the divine feminine. And that's why I wanted to have him on today's uh, show. But before we do, I want to introduce who's in the room. We have Christine, we have Dawn, Ian, Liney, Reinhardt. Selesh, Sheer, Steve, and myself. And before we get going, just to let you know that uh, on Fridays, we have the uh, beginning channeling class. And Ian, why don't you go ahead and tell everyone what that is? Sure. Uh, my name is Ian, and I host the weekly Ukulele weekly channeling practice group. And what it is, it's a group on YouTube that every Friday afternoon, those would-be channelers and those who chant can channel we all get together in a safe environment um and we learn from each other on how to channel how to speak light language um help each other with tips and just a, a great place for all of us to get together and learn together um that happens every friday it's free and you can look it up on facebook under hukalo weekly channeling practice group I don't hear Karen. Sorry, I'm talking and I had my mic muted. Sorry about that. I was just saying that our website is hukolo.org, which is H-U-C-O-L-O.org. And if you would like to become part of Club Hukolo, which helps support all of the activities that we're doing, like the channeling mm -hmm. class and our website and things like that, go to hukolo.org forward slash webinars, and you can become a member of Club Hukolo, and you will have access mm -hmm. to all the webinars. And those are every two weeks for the same trial. So Jim will be here next. So we have you, Rad, I'm gonna put you on the screen. And I'm going to I'm gonna there. So be, the way that we usually start is we usually start with a blessing. Um, just to, to to so that everyone can be centered and uh, in the right energy. But would you like to lead a blessing? Myself? You don't have to, but if you would like to. If not, I will do it. I, I'll be glad to. Okay, perfect. All right. Great. Go right ahead. Hmm. I start with my own breath. And I suggest everybody just take a little time and center on their breath. And part of the earth consciousness is sharing the consciousness of the earth and being a part of the dreaming of the consciousness of the earth. And even as we inhale, we are breathing in the air, one of the elementals that is a manifestation of the intelligence of the earth. So we just drink in the blessing that is our unique standing as sovereigns on this earth and know of its importance to the galaxy and that what happens in the galaxy happens across the universe. That we here on earth have a hugely important task and dispensation owing to our creation and our creator. And so it is. And so it is. Thank you. It's beautiful. So Liney, we can we can hear him. So if you have oh you were saying I had no sound. Okay, no problem. So just to let everyone know why I wanted uh, Rad on the show is because a few weeks ago, I believe, on CW Chanter's channel. Uh, I got to first. I got to hear him uh, the night before I was on, and then the next day. And I just loved his perspective because he is looking at the world from 
a different perspective than a lot of us have been raised. He, I think he truly has a beautiful uh, relationship with Gaia herself and with Mother Earth and with the goddesses of the earth, as well as understanding the balance of the divine feminine. And, and we had a very long conversation, not too long after um, we first talked to each other, it was quite a long conversation, but you five know- Five and a half hours. Okay, it was a long conversation. We had a five and a half hour long conversation, but we talked about literally I would think almost everything that you could think of to talk about when it came to the earth and how we're walking on the earth and what is the what is the uh, purpose of what we're doing and what are some of the energies that are at play. And, and especially now as we're looking at the transition from patriarchy into a more balanced, hopefully a more balanced form that honors the, the divine feminine. So he, he has a perspective that is not the, I'll say, it's not the common one because it's earth-based and the things that you will, that he understands are things he sought out and learned from from really diving into those, to those uh, traditions. And a lot of that has been lost and a lot of it is the Native American tradition, but also uh, from an alchemical standpoint and from an earth, uh, what did you say? Animistic standpoint. Animistic is core. Right. So, so I'm going to put you back on the screen. So for that, so today is not going to be a channeling webinar, but today is going to be a knowledge sharing webinar. And I'm sure, um, but he does have, uh, 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 ideas about space and about other beings coming in also about the other planets and things like that. So there are questions that you can ask, but this is not going to be a channeling webinar, but once you listen to his perspective, you know, we'll be taking questions about his perspective. And I think that's the best way to do it. So why don't you, if you can sort of give everyone the, yeah, the introduction to you and, and, and really your sort of basic philosophy and, and the way that you're perceiving your yourself here and, and what you're perceiving the earth and, and everything to be. I guess that's the best way to say it. In less than five and a half hours. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the perspective, I mean, in many ways, the perspective I could call it and to help people get somewhere close and then I can maybe clarify it. Because there's, um, there's a lot of terminology that gets used. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lack of concision in a lot of the terminology that gets used. Um, there's a lot of woke terminology that gets used. Um, and, um, and, and I guess it helps in conver it helps in conversation, but not so much in deeper discussions. And, um, so the term I would use broadly mm. is Gnostic. Okay. okay. Um, but the not Gnostic, the Gnostics have been around for a very long time, really, really long time. But the general definition of what is Gnostic is what is found in the Nag Hammadi texts. Some texts that were written around what in the official timeline, and I have problems with our official timeline, but we'll stick with the official timeline. We all know it. Um, you know, they they put the Gnostics at around like the first first few centuries A.D., um, which is when those Coptic texts were found. Right. Um, and those texts get called Gnostic texts. Um, for from um. Cert, there are some certain Gnostic scholars, and one of the more primary Gnostic scholars is a somewhat controversial man by the name of John Lamb Lash. And um, but he was through the guidance of the of Sophia herself and his own shamanic capability, and, and the and fact that to tell everyone, Sophia is is your is your uh, name for. Sophia is the is the quality. Mm. Okay, because we're going to get into a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, we're going to kind of walk backwards into it, into what I would consider the Gnostic okay. or teles or telestic, which means those who are aimed, um, the telestic perspective. Um, Sophia 
means wisdom. It's not a name per se. Um, but the God, the quality of the goddess is wisdom. Sophia or Sophia. Sophia is kind of like a different sounding to, to separate the word from a, from an entity. Right. Or from, right. an, from an aeon, to be specific, if we're going to get into kind of like a zoological type of uh, breakdown of, of the entity, so to speak. But it's really cosmological. Um, so Sophia means wisdom, or Sophia. But I'll say Sophia is to refer to to her, to the goddess. Okay. okay. Um, as, as her consciousness, and then Gaia being the manifestation of the earth which is an aspect of her consciousness. But in many ways, the earth would be to her, would, you know, just like we have an indwelling spirit in the body, while well, the earth has the indwelling spirit of Sophia and the body of Gaia. Um, but wisdom, wisdom to me is the what I like to focus on because um, that is the quality of, um, an aeon is kind of like groupings of consciousness from the originator originator is the word that we would use for the creator of the creators um in other words the way where the creator is for all intents and purposes the mat the originator is unmanifest okay and that the manifest part of the originator are the aeons and the aeons have qualities so in a, in a case of Sophia, her quality is wisdom. Um, the initial emanations come in syzygies or dyads or pairings. So she was coupled with felite or intention. And you can see the exquisite kind of positioning of intent and wisdom. Hmm. Because we would want our intent to be informed by wisdom. It's the we, sort of know, the, uh, principle as well. And in many ways, I mean, you can almost say in a certain way, um, you could see it, that certain bonding in, a, in the kind of opening of the, I guess, the book of the law, you know, the, um, um, there was that will will be the whole of the law. Yeah. Um, um, or, you know, love, or whatever, you know, it's love. The, the, the positioning is of love and will. And in many ways, even even in that, we're seeing the, the that particular syzygy of intent and wisdom, love and will. Yeah. Um, and so I'm like, I kind of, uh, the, the question kind of backed into, I really, uh, but I'm kind of like laying the ground a little bit of the cosmology. So anyway, so, so wisdom is our, I mean, I don't really, I'm trying not to get into the necessarily the whole narrative, although it might at some point come out in questioning because it's a lengthy telling to, to tell the narrative would um be exhaustive in a way well maybe you can talk about that from that perspective of sophia we are in a imbalance well, I, well let me go back maybe you could talk about the the creation or the becoming of or the manifestation of sophia as she became the actual earth the actual planet okay. That's okay, that's a good part of the narrative. That's a good um, part. <laughs> okay, well, in the narrative, the 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 species, life itself, but that would include all unfoldings. So that would you know everything from your very first basic single cell that will then um, assemb assemble itself into myriad forms is what we see, as at least you know it's what we can observe on life. That you know, the, everything starts with a single cell. Right. Um, if we remove the concept of time, if we could just like, you know, take time out of any concept and then just see how, uh, how from a single cell, we're now where we are. And you can just see that, that it's the necessary building blocks of consciousness that, you know, the first establishment of life would be a single cell. Right. Once the single cell is, in, is, is established, then, then create, then creativity takes place, different kinds of single cells happening. Then you have groupings and then from there on you have the building what some people might say is an evolution is really for me an unfolding of a plan that was already part of an unfolding genome that got created and that the genomes 
got created as something that a concept that you hopefully people have heard of is panspermia. And the concept of panspermia is that when the genomes of life were created in the galactic center by the aeons, but specifically, apparently, it looks like the the the, uh, uh, the kind of like the finished product input input from all aeons, but the kind of focus on the creation of life and with the kind of anthropos or uh, uh, you know anthropine like we are, mm -hmm. you know. The, as opposed to bovine, which is a cow, or porcine, which is a pig. Um, one moment, one moment. Someone, DJ, we have to mute you. There you go, hon. Okay, she's muted. If you come in the chat, mute yourself straight away. So, okay, go right ahead. So, so in, once the species that would be unfolding, uh, or were hoped to unfold in, in an experiment, because it's an, an experiment yeah. from the aeons, so a, a kind of a, a, a panspermia, I would almost equivalent i mean i'm not saying this is the ex exact dynamic but if you've ever seen uh, the kind of little puff balls that look almost like a mushroom and if you hit it it puffs out all kinds of spores yeah well i imagine something like that from the galactic center happening where after the design was made there was almost like a a puffing out of the panspermia onto the galactic arms so that it would just settle on the various worlds and as conditions arose and um opportunities presented themselves these life forms could unfold. Um, if anybody ever wants to Google the Mimi virus as just a kind of a concept of something that could could be a pan, a, a, a panspermic uh, form, um, very unique um, organism packed in a, a what looks like I think it's an icosahedron um, that it, that could could actually exist in. <coughs> interstellar space or the interstellar medium mm. um, and then be able to land with its genetic program very very safely intact and then be able to unfold in a hospitable environment what is it called how do you spell it the mimi virus m-i-m-i-v-i-r-u-s that's what they call it okay mimi virus just i just want to okay um, so the, then, so once, so basically, you know, we're we figure, the timelines are we're going back in time. So basically, the panspermia had happened, and life arose throughout the galaxy on suitable planets, and in, and obviously, in certain cases, anthropine species arose throughout the galaxy. Right. And so the as the um, the aeons in the galactic center, which is also called in Gnostic terms, the pleroma or the fullness, right. a term that I think I've heard you use similar, not the pleroma, but the word fullness in your, some of the things you've said, Karen. Yeah, in the, the Puranam in, in, in Sanskrit means fullness. Pur yeah, right. Yeah. Right. I remember you. So, it, so the pleroma means fullness in Greek. Right. Um, so from the observation point of the galactic center of the pleroma there w had seen that um, there was problem with anthropine species that there was um they kept on destroying each themselves some way or another or failing and this was observed by um, the galactic center because it was an experiment that's the whole idea was to create something send it out and see how it develops <laughs> there's a certain amount of hands off aspect from of, of creation in the galaxy yes. create and observe and so there the one you know as one of the main creators of the genomes that got sent out Sophia was observing the the, the failures of the species and it, apparently the, that anthropine species throughout the galaxy had arisen nine different times so there were nine different, so that was, so we kind of, we could kind of call that, we got up to Anthropos nine. And apparently in her concern for what was going and in her own creativity, there was, a, I guess, a desire to enmesh herself more fully, to bring more wisdom to the experiment. And um, that seemed to create a break off um, from her almost Almost, I mean, I don't like to use the word obsession, but it was like a focus, 
an intense focus on the problems and and you know the creativity that provided what would look like a remedy but this the genome had already been sent out and so apparently this set up some kind of dynamic and um I have all kinds of interesting things, but they're not part of the straight narrative. I don't like to to, to, uh, to deviate very much, but it, it ultimately it ended up in her this de detaching. I'm not sure that it would be all of her, but certainly an aspect because these are pleuro these are plasmic currents. Right. So an aspect of her current, at least if not all of her shot out into the galactic arms which are also known as the kenoma so we have the pleroma which is the galactic center and then the arms are considered the kenoma and she kind of shot out towards the orion belt and but settled and you have to realize this is um, this is living god plasma that shot out with all its consciousness but specifically with the aeonic consciousness of wisdom but as you know, as the pleroma all share, the, as they all kind of, I mean, the, the galactic center is a torrid inter, inter, <coughs> interweaving of all the <coughs> qualities of the originators of the originator. Um, so she so the 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 mythos holds that she plunged into the section of the gal of the galaxy there was some terror on her part um certainly and some uncertainty and um but she finally seemed to settle um in her trajectory to this part perhaps that's where she was focused and most of her settled here and some of her kind of broke off hmm. Because um, you know it's a plasmic current, so just like a parts of a cloud, you could have the main cloud, you'd have little wisps of cloud breaking off. Right. And um, so she, she, once she settled, realized, I guess, started to pull some of the material from the kenoma around her, and by keeping her plasmic center, and as and as more and more people um, are starting to realize that rather than an iron core, we have a plasmic center. And from a scientific point, I like that because that's confirming to us Gnostics that the plasma that left the pleroma and turned into the earth still maintains its plasmic qualities. Mm, right. It didn't become something else. Right. But it clothed itself. Right. In the material, uh, in the galactic arms and formed a planet. Anyway, some of this breakaway in the Gnostic myth, some of this breakaway energy still has some life juice in it and uh, it's a very interesting that where this all occurred was out by the by orion in other words it, we're a little bit in towards the galactic center from orion orion's a little bit more towards the outer part of the galaxy galactic arms but some of this breakaway kind of headed in that direction and um at least in some cosmic in some galactic histories the Ryan Belt is one of the main places where some Draco type beings had already arisen in the other, uh, the, the original seedings, the original panspermia, because the species that arose were not just anthropine, some of them were in saurine or, you know, lizard like. Right. And because some of this breakaway consciousness, and part of that was tied in the fear and the confusion of her trip kind of held those qualities, but it seems that it chose to uh, uh, mimic what it perceived in the, in the Orion galaxy. I'm getting a little bit crazy here. But anyway, that's where the, in Gnostic terms, the demiurge was formed, right. that breakaway. So we have the main part, her, her main part, she turns into the planet, but some of the <coughs> breakaway of her own turned into another unintended being and some some beings that seem to kind of emanate from that being as well and this is what in gnostic terms is both the demiurge and the archons that are a result from this extra right but i don't i want to get back to sophia so sophia eventually turns into a suitable planet and once the planet is inhabitable uh in our mythos a certain almost like a certain kind of um, plasmic wormhole uh, extended from the pleroma so that a fresh 
a fresh supply of of panspermia with the the anthrop anthropic genome could become on come on the earth because the earth is such a late arriver the panspermia had gone out and not only so not only did the panspermia arrive but an, the upgrade part of the um, uh, attempts to repair the mistakes of the early anthropines was part of the seeding. Mm. So, so where all the anthropines and the rest of the galaxy are part of the other seedings that kind of built in themselves and resulted in, in what we might call Anthropos nine. Um, when when new when the new panspermia rose came on Earth, it was in the form of Anthropos ten. So can, do you know what the other forms were, those other nine? I mean, you say Dracos, is there another? No, no, no. I mean, panspermia is a life germ. Okay, okay, okay. So sentient species will arise in different areas according to, I guess, conditions. So like and the, uh, what do they call it? The uh, Goldilocks, uh, not Goldilocks. Yeah. Yeah, is it Goldilocks? No. Goldilocks so, planet? Yeah. So, I, you know, so you'll have a, I guess you'll have a specific species that arise as the apex sentience okay in certain cases that apex sentience will be anthropine like us in other cases it could be saurine and in other cases it could be piscine you know or fish i mean again there's it's just a matter of, there's a sentience that was sent out and it could take any form mm -hmm. but the an, an anthropine is one of the forms okay. uh, an anthropine seemed you know um there seems to be a certain kind of, uh, to me, the star, you know, the star shape, you know, the head, the two hands, the two, you know, there seems to be something. And even even some of the, uh, the other, like a saurine species still seems to follow that model. Okay. okay. Did those pl did those species also end up also on the earth as well as because you have the 10th seeding, which I'm assuming is would, would be what humanoid or the. Or, or just the seeding of itself being the entire uh, animal plant to, and it would be the t entire panspermic genome but with the anthropine genome being the apex. Okay. yeah you know, you know it's you know it's just like you know you have when you have like software you have 2.0 3.0 you know stuff like right. that <laughs> excuse me um so so with this, so, so I, I mean, I really believe that much of the interest from other anthropine species across the galaxy has to do with them being aware that the anthropine species on the Earth is a uh, has more has more design because it's upgraded from all of the past mistakes. Correct. Did and. My guess is the reason why Sophia or Sophia took such an interest in it is because what she saw that was lacking was wisdom. Mm. So whereas maybe even the other species would become technologically advanced, they were still lacking in their wisdom. Correct. And would that even hold true for the early, the early, uh, Things like Lemuria and and uh, the other uh, the thing that sunk. And what's the other one that sunk? Um, that I can't think. Atlantis. Of. Yes, is that Atlantis? Are those? Would those be? Are they still the sort of ten point ohs, or are they? Are they? They're they're all ten. Everything that's happened on the Earth will be the ten. Okay. Okay. I mean, you know, they're the. Theosophists and Blavatsky, and they have these root race concepts, and you know they're they have uh, you know they have some discussion points, um, but it's it's all this it's all the new the new genome, the, the Anthropos ten, the genome that can includes Anthropos ten. So, what is our wisdom opposed as opposed to well, maybe the wisdom that we should be utilizing as opposed to the other wisdoms or the non-wisdom beings what is that how is that manifest then do you know what I, I, mean? don't this, no, so, I don't so if sophia brought wisdom and the seeding here was say 10 the 10 point or 10.0 anthropos 10 yeah anthropos 10 then what would say anthropos 9 have been well As i being, I mean, if I had to get again, this is this is me being um, 
walking a little bit out of what I would consider the Sophianic narrative, but the Sophianic narrative gives you, um, puts you in contact with the wisdom goddess. And then with, from direct contact with the wisdom goddess, you will get other things that I think are unique to, for, uh, to know. I mean, the, the, so the, a creation, a good creation mythos will, will ground you and bring you into contact. And then I feel that the real unfolding and flowering of the, of the rest of the wisdom will come as a gnosis and an experience. Right. That most important is the mythos that gets you grounded and in communication. Um, and too much information in too many different directions and like talking about other, other beings from other planets can be a distraction. Yes. Yeah. Because it's always putting everything outside of you as opposed to inside and, and internal. Correct. Yeah. But the, the, there's the, in, within the mythos of the uh, Australian origines is them identifying humanoid species from Pleiades. Technologically advanced humanoid species from Pleiades coming to this earth and entering into an agreement with the origines to share DNA. That is one of the questions that's actually in the chat, uh, the, the YouTube. It's saying, um, there was a response She's uh, from Trinity. She says, uh, then other species tried to manipulate the 10th programming throughout time to upgrade their own levels. That's what she's. Yeah, that's what I'm, kind of, that's what I'm getting at. Okay, you're, you're on track, Trinity. Just hold tight then. Cause <laughs> no, that's, yeah. that's, that's excellent. We're going there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, and I don't see it as, sneaky or or um manipulative on their part i mean basically if you're of a similar genome if you're interbreedable because you have that much of a common genome but you know that one uh, one of the other genomes as technologically uh, rudimentary as they still are actually has something that you don't have and you might benefit from you can see why somebody might go well look you you're still relatively fresh and have no technology. We have technology and you have an upgrade. Um, <laughs> yeah. Perhaps we can arrange something here. And I, I see it actually as nothing nefarious. Right. In other words, they, they, what, what do they have to offer? I mean, this, this is an agreement. And this is to me the basis part of, of what, what some of you might want to call cosmic law, which cosmic agreement, the way, the Tao. That you enter into agreements. That's you know. So like, where somebody goes, okay, we got technology and a similar genome. You have something in your genes that we don't. Do we have a trade? Right. Do we right. have an agreement? And in which case, the originis said yes. Okay. okay. Which to me is totally legit. Yeah. And when you talk about the originis, you're talking sort of back in the days. Where are you talking about currently? I'm talking, the origines is to me the correct term for aboriginal. Okay. Because ab means away. Okay. So like, in other words, like, like I'm a body worker. So adduction is pulling something towards your body. Abduction is going away. So aboriginal means away from original. Mm. So again, then we, we have that language games that are not nice. Yeah. Sometimes the language says exactly what it is, don't they? Doesn't it? Yeah. So that's why I say, if, you know, in this case, the, I call and rather than aboriginals, we call them the origines because mm. they're the original people of Australia. Right. And and they have in, in, in their own mythos that they did. They did share genes. They did eat. They did take on the technology. But we were so developed in and in, in being in the dreaming. And being able to speak with nature and get, I mean, there were so there were so many different fruits and things that we eat now that were not originally like that. Right. But we were able through our creativity and speak and to talking with nature to make things happen. That's a technology in its own right. Right. Some would call it magic, but it's 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 truly a grounded technology. Yeah. And so, and it's the most important thing is like you can because nature is where you get your food and your resources from. If you have your food and resources figured out, what else do you need? I mean, we live on, you know, this is paradise. Right. This, is a, 
this is this isn't the world that was built to get in a car and go to a job right that's not the purpose and um so uh, and according to the to the the origines own mythos they adopted the technology and then decided that it took them it took them too far away from their spirituality and went back to being the way they were found when the you know when the english went there mm. they had or they had thousands of years ago given up the technology isn't that interesting um well, and know, so, so now with people when, as soon as they sort of get a taste of really of real nature is as soon as they get a, a, a true experience of being outside and being part of you know the forest or the ocean area and and just experiencing that and and utilizing the fruits of it they find that i mean a lot of people find that's all that they really need or want there, there's not much more and all your true your true happiness comes in being grounded in that and then but imagine the nature that we as modern humans appreciate and then taking it to the level where everything is alive and intelligent and something you can converse with right that, that, that just the way the pleiadians inter uh, contracted and went into agreements with the with the earth people similarly the earth people were doing this with the nature spirits and all the intelligences of nature they were entering into similar agreements and getting and, and getting great fruits um and then so and that's the and that's a group speaking of where they identify of being from the Pleiades and then you have the Dogon story talking about the Nomo but that's a Syrian based one mm. uh, but again it seems like there's a, you know an el an elder ant you know an elder galactic anthropine race coming here and certainly having they seem to be more shamanic um, and more gifted in that way and um, and again they seem to enter into an agreement but the, the interesting, what I, to me, what's important about both of these creation stories, unlike the Anunnaki one, although the Anunnaki one has uh, certain things hidden in it, if you know how to read it, is that there's already an established Earth species for these other beings to interact with. In other words, we're already here. The Anthropos 10 is already on the planet mm. and has been for as long as memory can recall. Again, we're the seeding. Um, so there are certain people who might go, oh, you know, the Pleiadians created us. No, no, the Pleiadians found us and we did or we did a genetic exchange. The Nomo found us and had some information to share, but we were here. Right. right. Um, and apparently, and these other beings want to interact with us. And in neither case was this about uh creating a servile race the servile race comes a little later in history and unfortunately the you know the servant race concept gets close to a lot of hearts because it gets right into the middle of monotheism and its creation story and um and how close that kind of ties in with the anunnaki creation story um but in each case whether you you know whether you have cain leaving Eden and going out and marrying an earth wife. <laughs> yeah, or yeah. you have the Sumerians who in some of their early, some of the tape, you know, things when they're growing their gardens before they created their slave species, were having a lot of problem with the, with the native humans who are coming in and, and raiding their gardens and bringing the wild, the wild organisms from the forest into their pristine gardens and creating uh, a, you know, a little bit of an ecological problem for them because these these were kind of like uh, almost grown in a, in a sterile environment the ones that the anunnaki were growing and when when we were coming from the forest we were bringing all of those all of those organisms which in certain cases would be pathogens mm. and uh, but so in in each of these other stories even the ones that supposedly certain agents were were are responsible for creating humanity humanity is already on the planet right so so then we come down with okay it looks from these stories that something was created what is this thing and because unfortunately what i'm calling a thing for many people is a creation story of who we are and i'm no thing so there's a little you know sometimes there comes a little bit of an issue there but it, it is a nuanced story it's not cut it it's not cut and dried nor black and white 
because um, um, cr you know mixing genes on this planet is just just the way it goes. Right. So um, anyway, I'm going to take I'm going to drink some coffee, take a breather, and maybe there's some questions. I hope I'm doing okay. No, you're doing great. Um, Trinity asked. She asked a good question, and uh, she said, "Is has there been an eleventh and twelfth upgrade over ten now?" No, no, no. We're we're awaiting Anthropos eleven. We are those of us who are awakening and reconnecting to the consciousness of the planet will morph into um, the uh, Anthropos eleven. So, it, would you, would you make that equivalent to moving from say? third dimension to fifth dimension or would you say it's an actual physical physiological uh, upgrade with no change in dimensions well the, the, you know dimension is really more of a perceptual thing i mean they the dimensions are yeah um and we so and we um I would say that in many ways from third dimension to fifth dimensional consciousness, we'll call it, okay? Really is about moving from the third chakra, which is the lower will, to the divine will of the, of the what we call the throat chakra, because it is through this, that the agency of speech, that we allow our will to be known. Right, right. Um, but it's, but because this will is being fed by the heart because you know again we have this channeling so a lot of times with the lower will we're just getting the information of the first chakra the second chakra the third but basically the biological consciousness mm -hmm. um and but once we once we can move into the heart and then from the heart move into the higher will that it becomes that becomes a, a, a life of where the will is is basically for in many ways channeling wisdom because the heart is where wisdom is right right um so to, to me anthropos 11 is about full movement into the heart into wisdom and then from that seat of wisdom we can act from our higher will that higher will is kind of symbolic is of the fifth dimension so, so it, it it can be um do you, well, let me just ask this. Do you think there'll be a moment where, say, children coming in will be in that heart space? Or, or is it something that, is that the journey of man to go from one to the other? Because the way that it's sort of, and, and, I, and it's the one thing that happens in sort of the metaphysical world is that we mix a lot of systems. And so people pull things from everywhere. But within your understanding, or the way would you describe it? Would you describe it as a an, an entire movement of man to, from one to the other, or would it be something that you access when you have sort of returned to the earth wisdom in, in fullness of that? Did, did I ask a question correctly? I don't know if I did even. It got a little long, so I had trouble tying some ends together. Okay. Okay. My question is, is 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 it going to be all of humanity that moves into this heart space? Or is it gonna or is it gonna be a journey of an individual over time? It is an individual, yeah, it's an individual journey. You sell you self-select for it. And to me, you self-select by becoming, by entering in to the dreaming of the consciousness of the earth. Just like there was an agreement, you know, with according to the very, you know, like, you know, like let's take the, you know, the original story of agreement with the Pleiadians to do something. It's, it's about entering into a conscious um, acknowledgement of the conscious, of the, you know, the, of the goddess herself. Right. And and then being able to dream with her, because I mean it kind of ties into what uh, people will call not a simulation, a hologram. You know the fact that we live in a hologram, which is right. not a simulation. Right. A simulation right. is a duplicate of something real. Right. 
So some people say, oh, this is all a simulation. So that anybody who wants to posit, I go, well, simulating what? Yeah. <laughs> it has to be based on something, right? R right. So, to, so I, t we live in a hologram, and that hologram is her dreaming. Right. But within that hologram, there is a, a hacking that has gone on. It's a neural hack. And this is where we tie into the archontic energies and the demiurge, but we don't need to go there right now. Because um, I'm focusing on what we're supposed to be doing rather than, uh, you know, the tricksters. Well, we're going to we're gonna stay with Trinity because she's kind of moving the conversation along. You, she, She's asking the questions right as you're hitting the point. And so when you get, talk about the trickster, her question was, uh, she says, tell him, and I guess that's you, that I'm already in love with what you are sharing. She said, I would like to know where the desire to kill and maim each other came from. <laughs> Perfect question. <laughs> and why warring seemingly has always been present. We warring has... Trinity, just a great question. Half hours one day. You should have been there. It was an incredible conversation. I was exhausted and had to lay down afterwards because it was a great conversation. Yeah. Um, it, the reason it seems like warring has always been with us is because of a false t telling of history and also the lack of depth of what is called history. And we all, and even there's, there's a big reveal in the word his story right because his story is not our story right so in his story all we hear about is war 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 from the beginning yeah but history doesn't go deep our story is real deep in time and our story is not full of war and maiming history starts almost when the war and maiming starts yeah yeah so and interestingly at the individual level our story would be called my story and there is another thing so what history doesn't understand they call mystery mystery is code for my story or our story mm. so the our so our our story is hidden behind mystery right yeah. yeah. And instead, yeah. what we are fed is history. Right. right. True. true. Very true. You you know what's interesting? We talked about it and um, about, and this is specifically for Trinity and her question, but we talked about religions and how they advanced on the earth. And it, it has been the Abrahamic religions that have always spread the religion through war and not the earth-based religions. They have always been either tried to eradicate or depressed, but some of the monotheistic religions are the ones that force the narrative to pick up who I, I'm not having some feedback I'm going to put on my headset but they they force the uh, they force the people to pick that up and and they have spread through the sword and most if you look at the if you look at history his story the histo history is always that of from the perspective of the monotheistic religion we have yet to hear the mystery stories, which are those of the earth religions. And if you listen to them, especially from the shamanic standpoint, of those are the ones that we have more access to, the aboriginals, it's always a combination of earth sky people, of a harm harmonious life that was lived as a, as a group and as a, in a theme of this. And then you have always this sort of monotheistic religion that comes and tries to squanch that and take over that and eradicate that. And it's a much different perspective. Maybe you can talk to that a little bit. I don't want to blow anybody's mind and we're not talking anti any kind of belief system, but, the, but it is very true that 
it is the monotheistic belief systems that assert and need and want everyone to believe as they do. Because it's because if you believe differently, you're not controllable. But if you can get everybody to line up in a perfect line, believing, you know, this, this, and this, and this is wrong, and this is right, and there's one authority as opposed to you being the authority and the earth being the authority and nature being the authority, it's it's a totally different ballgame. And 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 what we talk about moving into the fifth dimension, which is the heart dimension, it pulls you back to the earth. It pulls you back to nature. And there's a difference. And so we see it now. We can hear that call a little bit more clearly to come back to that. But, it, but it, you know, I'll just say this. There's no, um, in, the, in the Celtic belief system, they used to listen to the earth. They used to listen to the, the nature. And you know, the bells of the Christian church, when they would ring, they would ring them at all the times of the, of the, of the prayers of the pagans in order so that they couldn't hear anymore the earth. So it, it's, a, it's, it's a very clear thing. And, and again, not to say anything differently, but you're talking about a, a, a desire for dominance of one over the other, whereas the earth religions didn't try to dominate anything. They tried to live in harmony with it. And I think that that's an important uh, distinction to know and to understand. But maybe you can elaborate on that. And if I did that correctly or anything. No, well, I just, I mean, yes, the, the in, in, Current in the current time, we if we you know if we want to kind of crystallize um, much of the error. Um, you see, one one of the, the two terms that I like to work and and they work very well um, in it for language is rather than right and wrong, we have correction and error. Matter of fact, part of where what we're undergoing right now here on the earth. Is what we're calling Sophia's correction, correcting the error. Um, much of what we're looking at, and it, basically, what you know, we've gone to monotheistic religions, but before monotheistic religions, we had state religions. So the poly polytheism of the Roman state and the polytheism of the Greek city states are part of the same thing. I mean, Socrates was put to death for lowering the memorials of, of the youth of Athens, but what he was doing was he was questioning the gods. Basically, he was being, a, uh, he was engaging in blasphemy. Okay, and this is before monotheism. So, but but what we're but so what we're really talking about are state religions that go with the city state and its law or Torah for all intents because that's what we're because to me the the real break the difference between the error and correction error has laws it is based in the law of the city state living in traditionally or on the earth. To me, we live by agreements with each other. We create our own rules, but we have no rulers. And these, these rules are our agreements. And these, this whole system of what some might call law, I call what, the way, or in other words, or the more Eastern term of Tao. And I like them because we have kind of like the same word, Tao and Torah, way and law. And it, with the way we develop our own agreements or rules or what some might want to call laws, but the word law to me is a, a, a word I have, a, I have an issue with. But again, you know, you still had, you know, you had the laws and, and the city states and laws go together. That's why the first kind of major laws was Hammurabi. 
who was an Anunnaki. If you see a picture of, 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 of Hammurabi, you'll see here, I think he was, the, the Anunnaki had their ranking with kind of like these horns on the side of the helmets. He was a low ranking one horn Anunnaki, but an Anunnaki nevertheless. And the Anunnaki, where they came from, it doesn't matter. Um, they, you know, I don't know if they're off planet or an elder, an elder earth race does, you know, to me, it doesn't matter. They certainly could qualify to me for Atlantean type people because the Atlanteans or, you know, you've seen in Vedic, we have the Vamanas. So in each, both in both Vedic texts and Atlantean texts, you have flying machines. Anunnaki means those who from heaven to earth came. From heaven basically means you came out of the skies. Doesn't mean you came out of space. So in many ways, I, I can see that the Anunnaki could be, have been an, er, you know, a, a, a technologically, a, a part of an earlier technological race that has survived certain calamities that a lot of the, the earth people hadn't. And when they did arrive, they arrived out of the heavens. And so this, you know, from out, you know, from earth to heaven. But to me, this implies little more than the descent from the sky, like any airship might doesn't have, you know, and it could still be an, a, an atmospheric airship. Um, so what, what we're really seeing, and the monotheisms are kind of the, 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 the breaking down, the throwing off of the extra and focusing on a central character. And in many ways, you know, it's like throw out everybody and keep Zeus or Jupiter, and then we'll call them Yahweh, is kind of what, you know, what we see happening. Um, and, but in, in not as part of history, but like, if you read a book like Chalice and the Blade by Rianne Eisler, and she gets back and she's looking at, she wanted to, she wanted to look at what were known as the goddess religions, which is where, where now we're getting back. And what she found in all of her research was all of the settlements that were, that clearly showed goddess religion and what we might call matriarchy in my to me matriarchy could have just very well have been how we did th you know again when we think of patriarchy and its illness patriarchy is you know very toxic mm -hmm. so very often i'm concerned when we think of matriarchy we're thinking of the same toxicity except with you know with different sense. genitalia <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um and that's not the case and I think it's especially concerning for men. You know, men go matriarchy. You know, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, basically they think of the same sickness, but from a different gender. Um, yeah. Which yeah. is about power. Which right. is about who rules. Right. And and what we find it was there was no ruling. There was organization. There was management. Um, there was coordination. There was coherence. And there wasn't war. Right. I think that's an important distinction to make because that is the that is sort of the thing of where you know you you see it now in the um, how do you say it in 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 the rise of the feminine you see this reaction being like oh now the women want to take over as opposed to the feminine wants to come and rebalance you know yes. And that's so matriarchy is, is sort of as toxic a word as matriarchy. I agree. Yeah. 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 And I do because I want people to feel, to really be able to feel what it was like when we lived in balance with each other. And that if one thinks about the family unit and that the town or village is always just one big buildup of this basic concept of family. Um, and then in the animistic things, you know, family keeps on extending the trees or relatives, you know, the entities that, that, you know, the stream runs by, that's an entity, that's a relative, you know, like every, we're all related. And, um, let me try to get back to my center of thought here. So, so Rianne Eisler, um, in her book, um, Chalice and the Blade, points that before these warring tribes showed up, and then one of the things is all the warring tribes had developed the cosmology of a storm 
or war god, God. Um, and so there, and, and, and the storm and war gods didn't teach people, so, you know, I don't want to call them civilization skills, because to me, civilization uh, needs to be cleaned up as a word. Um, the city states um, seem to be what we call civilization, and unfortunately, what we are currently experiencing isn't very civilized. Um, you know, the, the war, the, the warring world, the warring world, and again, the earth is different in the world. The earth is our realm that you now the earth herself, the world is the place that you need. Like if you go fishing and some guy with a badge and a gun shows up and go, do you have a license? That's the world. You don't need a license to fish on the earth, but you need a license to fish in the world. We are, we the Anthropos are sovereigns of the earth. We run into problems with the world and the world is a construct. It's a construct of the city states, their legal systems and the, and the concept that there are those who have a dispensation to rule over others as a class not as as natural leaders of a given unit um that arise naturally okay i i'm get i'm getting a little i i need to be recentered karen or anybody another i'm sorry I, no that's fine, that's we, fine. We, oh can you oh, mute your mic when i'm talking because we're, we're getting a big, getting a big uh, uh, feedback i don't know why because I have my headphones on now, so it shouldn't happen. But anyway, what we were talking about, and I'll mute when you're talking, is um, that we were talking about the rise of, of the sword and war. And how did we get to go from being a peaceful sort of, I don't, you know, you can't always say that it was peaceful, but, but, a, but a society that lived by agreement, that took care of its own, uh, it, it, how do you say, regulated itself, and then didn't ag have aggression towards others as opposed to a power driven uh, control group that that we that came in and and how did that originate my theory on what created this is when certain i and i see this I don't know where to start because uh, I guess I'll let's see. Cert certain humans, certain human animals, for some started to, uh, I would say, actually be driven by certain priests because the pre behind hidden behind hidden behind everything are are a certain priest class who. Um, as opposed to, I would call a shaman class, and the priest class are were the ones who were kind of uh, representing for these off-planet deities that had requirements. But this priest class apparently also had certain technologies, and those technologies were metallurgy and how to build weapons. What they didn't teach the people who they filled with these new ideas was how to grow food for themselves. But they didn't need to because the plan was teach them more and then let them steal the food and rule the people who can grow it. And I really feel that a big part of this priest class were priests who had their own agreements and own arrangements with an off-planet deity that the Gnostics called a Demiurge. And this deity said it would give them the world if it would follow its dictates. And um, so they contracted, they liked the deal. Um, and why would humans kind of do this? Well, maybe the second this these other creation stories are part of what happened to it, why humanity fell, but I don't want to get into that right away. Um, 
But anyway, I mean, it seems that th these other certain human animal tribes were just basically influenced, given a cosmology, given weapons, and of course, shown where to go find the food and women, and then go forth and, you know, and, um, you know, kill all the males, uh, or at least all the adult males, but probably all the males, kill all the women who have, who are already um, childbearing, and then keep, quote unquote, the, the prepubescence so that you, they will, you know, and um, breed with them. And I mean, there is ample evidence of all these huge settlements of the goddess worshipers were built in luxuriant val valleys that had great protection, like from winter winds, had scenic vistas that fed your soul, were you know, located by, river by rivers. They were always selected for their aesthetic and, and ability to uh, give us what we needed from life. They were not built high on accessible hills. There were no great fortifications because organized warfare was not there. War is a waste. It's a waste of resources. It's a waste of healthy men that can be doing other things like, you know, built like building a really nice village instead of going away and doing horrid things. So there is, you know, the, the very concept of war is based on parasitism that one needs to parasitize a host, but the host might resist it. So with weapons, it can no, the host can no longer resist the parasite. I, I mean, it's the sort of as above, so below, but micro macrocosm, if you look about how a parasite does invade something, and the goal of the parasite is to I'm going to ask you to mute again because we're getting the bad feedback again. But the goal of the, the parasite is to basically consume the host. And then once the host is consumed, moves on to another host and to another host. And that's what you see within the warring systems of as opposed to sort of the live and let live, enjoy your place under, you know, it's, it's the thing of, we have weapons, but we don't have food. We're going to go take over the food and we're going to, make you know we're going to get rid of the 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 stronger within that system and then also to on a genetic way to to breed with with those beings or those those earthlings and then also that eliminates the uh, original belief system that was there because all of the wisdom people are gone all of the 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 wise women wise men are gone and then you're just left with the young that you can take over and and we see it throughout throughout all of uh, all of history that his story that we really really know so yeah okay i'm you please <laughs> Sorry. i'll stop I'll talking stop uh well i don't know uh, where to uh, take it i mean the interesting of uh, paris parasites are really, they're not creative, they're just consumer. So they don't even think ahead. Um, like you said, you know, like the, their job is to con, you know consume the host. Their job is just to consume. Right, right. Um, to, and you know, and also they're not creative. So not only were they taking over the food and the women, they were taking over the settlements that were built by incredible masons, you know, with, with great skill from, you know, the ancient knowledge. And we see this, um, it, it seems pretty clear that the Romans took to are, 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 are credited in history with all these great developments. And it really appears that the Romans were a warlike people that, that basically conquered an earlier existing civilization with their knowledge, with the aqueducts. I mean, you, the, if you, there's a, a YouTube channel called New Earth. And what are known as Roman aqueducts are found in Mexico and South America. I mean, Roman aqueducts are found all over the world. And it mm -hmm. kind of speaks that aqueducts were a hydro culture of, of the original traditional high, highly civil, you know, highly technological humans. 
Um, and so, so because it because the Romans were not in Mexico, right, right. And um, and these are incredible aqueducts. And then we'll, and then even you know like when we look at some of the amphitheaters that are called Roman amphitheaters um, in northern Africa, you know, all along like the Mediterranean, northern Africa, they're you know like in Syria even. And we see what are called Roman, you know, coliseums and stuff. When you look at them, you see exquisite uh, craftsmanship. When you look at the Colosseum in Rome, it's like it's like a bad copy of these other ones. Um, and so it appears, I think the Colosseum in Rome was built by the Romans. So we get a chance to kind of see what is called Roman and what really is Roman. Hmm. So you think the Romans, the true Romans, were a different species altogether, a different group? Well, no, the Romans were the Romans, and the people who gave the Romans their culture right. are, the, are the unnamed ones. There's a good chance the Etruscans were those people. Okay. So, so I'm going to ask you to mute again because of the, the feedback. I don't know why it started, but... Um, so if we if we go away from all of that because that's it's it's a it's something to ponder for people who are new to this sort of idea that that we've gone well we know however you define it we know we've gone away from the earth and we know we've gone away from nature so i guess maybe the question would be how do we get back and 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 what is it that we what do we need to do to get back you know, and, and, and I will say this because a lot of the things that, that we talk about as a group here, it has a lot to do with extraterrestrials and channeling those energies and, you know, and, and it seems to, again, be looking out to other beings to sort of come in and help us and save us. But in fact, we, we are the ones that need to save us and we need to, so maybe you can talk about that from your perspective as, as, as someone who, you know, is is actively living that kind of life okay um f for myself my road to to greater gnosis and again gnosis is a greek word that means knowing but it's knowing because you've experienced it's not a belief it's something you've walked <laughs> excuse me the, so it was the Sophianic narrative, which is what I consider to be the humans, the human animals creation story. Um, that allows us to, to re-enter a living earth. An earth that is alive, that is conscious, that has agency, that has autonomy. But we are part of that. And so to re for us to to recombine our consciousness with the consciousness of the earth is to receive the instruction but that instruction isn't about that instruction is a co-creative endeavor because we are also endowed with a huge creativity so the a lot of it has is almost like to just using the consciousness i mean for instruction but also for the inspiration so that going, you know, so that this isn't like it isn't Sophia. It isn't her, just her wisdom conceiving it. It is our wisdom, us getting into our own hearts and looking out, realizing that we have an earth that we're sovereigns of. And then we're looking out at this world that has been built on our beautiful earth. And how did it get this way? And then and a big part is realizing that it's a psychological stance that we have. It's a relationship to the earth that creates the world we live on. We have lost our relationship with the earth. We have lost our sense of sovereignty. And by sovereignty, I mean standing as a sovereign where we have like an inheritance. This earth is our inheritance. And it's an inheritance that we, the human animal must share. And not only with each other, but with all of creation, with the whole living world, the whole living earth. And once we realize we're part of that webbing, 
once we reinsert ourselves into the animistic medium, we then get the direction and instruction. We can re-enter the Tao, the, the way, her way, wisdom's way. And then we can then conduct ourselves by kind of being all connected through the creator, where the creations are all reconnected to the creator so that we all act as one super organism with coherence, like the human body that communicates with each other. The heart is unique from the liver, but they don't fight each other. Um, there isn't a battle for who gets the blood, um, who gets the nutrients. Um, um, you know, calcium has a lot of uses besides being put in bone. But if you're, you know, if you're sit, I mean, if you're sitting most of your life and you need calcium for other reasons, your body will responsibly leach calcium from your bones because it, by all, from all feedback of bone use, you don't need that much calcium in your bones. Where if you're robust and using your bones a lot, you might need calcium, but the body might not might deny it or only give just a little bit because it can't take it from the bones because the feedback from body usage says no, we cannot, we can't take calcium from the bones. They might break if we take this calcium. So there's a you know there's a con there's a containment of within the body of all these different parts within the body, all in communication, and all working to keep a balance or homeostasis and health within one organism. And if we think of ourselves as all the cells within a body and the earth as the greater super organism, or almost, almost like a metaphor for the human body, and then coordinate like that. And this is even where when people get scared about nationalism, if we think of, you know, where there's a unique, a unique cultural identity, to me, that should be done in a holistic way with a W, where a, a nation would be like, you know, like a character. There's a heart, there's kidneys, there's, there's a liver, there's a gallbladder, there's it. So, so where there's a, so the cells of a heart are unique from the cells of a liver, but they work together. There's no competition, even though there's uniqueness. And I see nations as having a certain uniqueness, but again, like a body where it's all about. So, so you're good at this. So that's where, you know, so you, this is your function within the greater, humans, the human earth sphere. Um, and then if, and there's all kinds of breakdowns because even within the greater organs, there's a, there's a lot of um, duplication of services, redundancy, but they're redundancies at lower levels. So return, yeah, returning to earth consciousness is, and so that we all are operating from the same consciousness. Um, we, the, the breaking up into the various systems um, of, and especially, the, you know, the, crea the creation story is central. And that's why, you know, with the Sophianic narrative, it gives us our, our creation story on the earth, connects us into the galaxy and kind of stops there. Because there's only so much agency, there's only so much focus we can bring. So the earth is our primary focus, the galaxy being a secondary and then, I mean, this room for philosophical things are going beyond that, but it's, it's, we lose focus. We need to bring the focus to earth and, um, and understand that any other anthropoids uh, or anthropine species in the galaxy that might be interacting with us are know that we're the cutting edge and we need to realize we're the cutting edge, that we're, we're it. <laughs> In the galactic anthropine experiment, we are the focus. And unlike the other anthropine species that were on, all planets have some form of consciousness, but they're not aeonic consciousnesses. So the other thing is besides us having an upgrade, we have an aeonic consciousness as the consciousness of our planet. We have, we have a proximity uh, we live within the field. We live within the dreaming. We live in the hologram of of, of the wisdom goddess, and that m that makes our anthropine species, the human, the Earth human animal, very unique in the galaxy. Um, and that's why 
there's so much interest. We, I mean, we are the focus of the galaxy, and also because, and also because I feel what happens in, within a galaxy will have a pan galactic, and then with uh, with uh, and then galaxies acting as a whole will have a resonance with other galaxies. So there's a universal application. But what happens on Earth? The divine experiment on Earth, and the coming from Anthropos 10 to Anthropos 11, this highly sagacious being, and I mean, I feel that's that's our destiny to be the sages of the galaxy, and we are the sages because we are the children of the wisdom goddess. We live with the wisdom goddess. We're in her agency. That is our focus. So our, to, I feel our destiny is to be the sages of the galaxy, and this, and, and I. Pick the word sage because sages are known for being playful. You know, sages are known in many ways as old souls. You know, they'll at one minute they'll be they'll be you know going off on some kind of grand philosophy, and the next thing they'll be telling a fart joke. It's very grounded energy. It's it's mirthful. Um, there's great joy and mirth um, with wisdom, and um, I'll stop there for now. And I'm going to mute. <laughs> well, when you were talking about the great joy and mirth, I saw instantly. I thought of the the sort of the maypole dance and the the, the sort of dancing around the celebratory, uh, you know, with people celebrating always, celebrating the season, celebrating the the harvest, celebrating the birth, celebrating even death you know, all of the things. And there was always this celebration with the understanding that it was all part of the grand design of cycles and to to be in a tune with them and to be, uh, yeah, to, to be in the, in the, how do you say, part of the entire ecosystem of it. You know, there was the honoring of the, the trees and the water and the, the ground and the rocks and the, you know, it was a celebration constantly of, of thankfulness really to so that you like you said the agreements you know that if you're acknowledging and you're thankful and you're 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 making those harmonious kind of endeavors then you are getting everything you need that the earth is bountiful for you and and feeding you and clothing you and and giving you everything that you could possibly need and or want and we we forget that we forget that. So we, so we we a lot of it we forget it because we have been prohibited from access to the earth by the world. Right. right. The, 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 the actual, actual paved, paved world. world. The actual paved world, the world that we've built upon the earth. Even more than the paved world is the legal mm. world. Mm. The legal system is the poisonous web of this world. Because behind that legal system is an armed enforcement system. And is that armed enforcement system that stands between us and the earth. Well, access to it, use of it as, as it is our sovereign right. I, I understand that. So, so the question is now, how do you go back? Because you can imagine as systems, you know, the, the, well, the, what they keep us in fear of is systems breaking down. If the systems break down, if the electrical grid goes down, if the, you know, what happens to humanity? Because we are not, you know, hunting, gathering, growing as a, as a, you know, we're, 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 we're given our stuff. We go to the grocery store and buy our food. We're dependent on all of these things. And so if that system starts to shift, how do you, how does it happen in a peaceful way? So where there isn't the greed and, and the materialism, you know, within also the earth religions, you don't have the idea that there's this materialism because there's nothing to want really. Everything is shareable. There isn't you know, if, if, if one guy has an iPad, then the whole village considers themselves to have an iPad. You know, it's not my iPad, it's our iPad. And, you know, let's make more so that we can have enough. But, you know, on a technological way that we've gone sort of so, you know, deep into technology and, and materialism, how do we go away from it, but yet still yield the fruits of the creativity that created it 
so that we we can live on a more uh, equal footing with the way that we're supposed to live. Uh, I'll get that. I, I would like to refill my coffee. Okay. So I don't have dry mouth. Um, so <laughs> just give me one minute to be away from sure, the camera, sure. please. He's going to take a moment to get away. And if, if I see Trinity has questions, if anybody else has questions, I think this is a very interesting conversation. Paula's contributing a lot of, she, I know this is a lot of her perspective. Um, the, the speaker, so just so I can tell you, the speaker is Madi Wiz. Uh, he he has a channel called Modern um, Modern Wizard. You can find it on YouTube. It's also, there should be a card uh, attached to the uh and also in the chat, I have a link to his YouTube page. But he is an alchemist. He is a um, botanist. He is a uh, healer as well. And he he looks at life from the perspective of the divine feminine. And he's look he's looking at it in contrast with the patriarchy that's now in power. But he he's very much focused on the Gnostic story, the true Gnostic story that predates the Nakh Hammadi text, um, and. Uh, it being more of the earth itself being the, the organism that we are within the dream of the earth. And now we have sort of moved away from our uh, sort of true origins and gone more into this materialistic warring society. And, and now we're hopefully on our journey back, at least for the people that are remembering. And that's maybe in this case, the journey of man, at least where we are so far. And he had established that the earth and the, the, the beings on the earth were highly of the focus of the rest of the universe because of our being on a planet that is based in wisdom. I just sort of gave a quick summary, <laughs> tried to, but you have to go, you back, have to go to back, back to the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Okay, refocus me, Karen. <laughs> So my question was, how do we go back? And and now, because we are, you know, it's not like we're still in mud houses, at least the most of us. Though I, some, it would, might be good, good to go back to the mud houses, but sort of where we are, you know, we're now way spread out on the earth. We're occupying every nook and cranny of it. You know, how do we go back into the harmony of it, but my, maintaining our technological advances and also overcoming the materialism of greed? How do we do it? I, I, I feel that it's, it is at a consciousness level. I mean, one of the people who I think has been brilliant over the years, really laying out, especially the because the biggest hindrance to our dealing with each other are the systems and specifically legal systems all all of the all of these rules on paper and um max egan is is very brilliant about that the system that we so dislike those of us who come to take a really good look is held up by all of us. It is our participation that holds it together. And the idea, and, and part of it is tied up in how they have kind of hamstrung the, our, our, our consciousness with the idea of money. Um, the only value that, there, that truly exists is the labor and creativity of the human and the resources at, of nature. That is the only value. Now, if some of us agree to take a piece of metal that can be turned, and once again, metals have other uses. Silver has a lot of you. I mean, if, if you have a good village with a metallurgist, you can take any number of gold and silver coins, melt them down and turn them into ornaments or whatever you want. I mean, these, the, these are resources. So they have some intrinsic value, but the only value that they really have is that another human animal is willing to have this for something else they want for some skill or creativity or labor that they have. So the, the 
the world is hamstrung because when we look at all of the systems, let's say every modern system we have, whether it's electricity, uh, sewage management, whatever, these are not run by the elite. They're run by humans. They're all management. Even the people who designed these things were people who were not at the top. All of this, all, all of the know-how, all of the management is at the what I would call the human level and not the management or elite level. So all the skills are there. So if basically the only reason everything would collapse is if he says I'm not going to I'm not going to do what I've been doing to keep society running because it's not a paycheck. And the reason the the reason required a paycheck is I mean largely it all starts with land ownership. I mean, the, you know, the, again, the concept that one that some human can own the land, whether it's through purchase or the original way of, of establishing the, the nonsense was with the Pope claiming all land, you know, whatever. And then when Christian kings became Christian kings, they go, OK, you have this land and you have this land. But in other words, they were giving ownership rather than in the traditional way, the land belonged to the people on it. I mean, that's how you owned land. You lived on it. Any other concept of ownership is fictional. So we have to start, we have to start kind of parsing out what's fiction and what's real. Because we're living in a fictional world. We're living in a world built on one fiction after the other. And the world only really collapsed. The modern world we know is held together by us. And it only falls apart if we desert it because the paycheck stopped. Because the value, the creativity, everything is still there. But the world has now been set up where we only do these things for money, as opposed to we do them because without, if we don't do them, we go back to mud huts. I've seen some really nice designed mud huts. Oh, I. Haven't you, I, haven't you? Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, I lived. I lived at Omega. I were uh, for seven years, which is a holistic institute, one of the premier institute holistic institutes. And I did massage therapy there, and I lived in a tent for six months of a year. I had a nice tent. I pimped it out pretty good. Slept on a real bed. Had you know when they they allowed us to have some electricity. I even had an internet connection. But the the joy of living in a real community was that you you had all the, I had all the privacy of my tent like that was my little world that was my hermit cave but then from my tent I could go out to any number there was there was one house that was dedicated to games and TV there was a cafe there were endless places to socialize um I had to go to uh, a local dorm to shower you know I'm a male so peeing wasn't a big deal and 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 you know again the, there was a toilet not that far so although i you know the, it was i don't I, I actually miss living like that because i i had all the privacy i wanted all the solitude i wanted and then all i had to do was leave my tent and have all the social engagement i wanted and um there was great beauty in having minimal personal space and an amazing amount of social space. We had a lake. There were canoes. All you had to do was, you know, put on, a, uh, take a life jacket, get your paddle, and go out in a canoe. Um, if it was a busy day, you might have to wait for somebody to come in. Big deal. Most more times than not, you didn't have to wait. So there was access to. I mean, just so much. But meanwhile, I my my primary do domain was in a tent, and I was amazingly joyful like that and um and how we've kind of set up the modern world is where we kind of turn the social life into our own homes now you know where most of the activity happens in in our private space and not in our social space and i think part of that has been that you know we we have taken the privacy of, of a primary dwelling and turned it into a small castle of sorts, a small compound. 
and that so that we each live in our own compounds instead of living social lives and social lives is where we in, where, where we get to exchange information with each other take a, a, a a village reading of how things are going and are we do are we happy with that and if we're not happy with that what are we going to do about it rather than just griping right right i'll just I'll share just something share. when i was uh i was when i was doing theater i did a national tour of a, of a musical and we lived in a bus and all i had was this little cubby that i slept in and then I had one suitcase that I was allowed to bring with me, and that was it. And and it was the probably the happiest I think I've ever been, <laughs> I've ever been. I had the less the least to worry about. I had a good place to sleep when I needed to. I could get in my little cubby and go to bed. And then when I'd wake up, it would be it would be really peaceful. And also, I'll say when I went to India and I came back, India is 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 less built up than the rest of the world, and and then still the way that they're living is, is still in some parts in the city, it's different, but there's still this ecosystem that exists there. And I was very aware when I came back, how I realized that when I came back to the Netherlands, how unreal that it is, not that I don't like the Netherlands. I like it very much, but I had very much the feeling of I'm living in this game of this place that's called the Netherlands that has the Netherlands rules and has the society that's a certain way and the certain expectations of being here. And by being here in this place, I agree to these rules. I agree to live in this way. And there was that big, there was that part of me and there's still that yearning of me to not be in those rules, to not be governed by that. And to go back to the, mo you know, the, the most beautiful and the most simple and the most wonderful time I had is when I could just wake up from my very simple ashram room, which was one bed with one little table in and my suitcase and whatever I could carry and go walk on the rocks along the water. And that was my day. But it was just the most wonderful interaction and to be able to walk up the mountainside and walk down and, you know, it was so simple and so pure. There wasn't a lot of distraction from anything else. And there was plenty of people around that you could talk to and have interactions with and laugh and do everything. But you weren't bogged down by everything else. And it's so attractive to just let that go. And you wonder when you're in that, when you've gotten steep, steeped back into it, what you're needing all the other stuff for. What is it really serving you at all? It's nice to visit maybe, but I would rather live in the, the most natural way. That that's my that's my finding. I don't know about you, but maybe that's something what you were saying. You know, just to be able to live in that and, and visit the other things. I would like to bring up uh, the concept of poverty. Because okay, it kind okay. of applies here and with traditional mm -hmm. living. Um, let's say that a modern country like China that supposedly is credited with lifting, you know, millions out of poverty. In other words, they, people who were peasants who had like a little plot of land and a couple of pigs and whatever, and were living on a dollar a day, $2 a day, whatever the money, money figure is. And then, so they were relocated into cities and given jobs. So now they make ten dollars a day, you know. They're you know, and, 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 and or or whatever. So they're not in poverty anymore. Are they happy? You know, peasants often don't. They don't live easy lives. But almost anybody who's done kind of work and gone to very very poor areas and work with people, they say one of the things that is most common and so beautiful that they experience with these quote unquote, poor communities is how much laughter they hear. There is an ease of life because you're not always looking at a clock. You're not always meeting a deadline. You're doing life. And so when, so when we hear these words like poverty, what all poverty is, is putting a monetary value on a human life. So if somebody's living on a dollar a day, we're supposed to be horrified rather than how many times did that person laugh during that day? And maybe that day they didn't even need a dollar because the way they were, there's no rent to pay. 
because they might still be living traditionally on the earth. There's a, there's a clean running river that they can get potable water. There's plenty of game and there's plenty, you know, there's plenty of produce. So in other words, all, you know, and again, even with the, with the peasants, you know, they might, you know, they grow a little rice, they have a pig, you know, they have a goat for some milk. They're fed. They have their very simple dwelling. They get through their winters um, and they get to appreciate the sky and the earth and the wind. And, and so, you know, there is this Western way of saying, oh, but they live on a dollar a day as if that's a terrible thing. And, and again, it's not, we measure, we measure the quality of their life in dollars rather than in laughter. How many times did they laugh that day? And um, so that is part, you know, that to return to get some sanity back into our lives, we we have to realize the twisting of information and the use of language that creates scenarios. Oh my God! Oh, I want to live in poverty, and but once again, it's not about the quality of life. It's not about joy. It's not about laughter. It's not about the amount of free time that we have to explore this planet, this Earth. Um. So there, there's a huge mindset uh, reset, mind resetting that I feel really needs to occur for us to get to a more sacred way of living again. The language we use to describe life is often not describing the sacred. It's describing the world. And the and, and our abilities to meet the demands of the world, and the world demands much of us. I'll leave it there. You're You're muted, Karen. I, I got a little teary. I think that was beautiful what you just said. And and as you were talking, I just. I could hear the wind and I could hear the water and I could hear the air and, and the plants and everything calling, you know. So um, I just want to take a second because it made me very emotional. Trinity, if you have a question, why don't you go ahead? Is she still there? Maybe. There she is. Yes. Hello. Hi. I forgot the gentleman's name I'm speaking with. My name is Rad. Hello. <laughs> I had to meet you, uh, get online here. Um, if I had the uh, knowledge you do, I would say the same things you are sharing. So, so somehow there is this innate knowledge that we have when we hear you speaking or someone similar to your understanding, it is like we know it, so it resonates. So. That's really awesome. So thank you for being here today. That's the first thing I would like to say. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And for um, the second. She froze. Let's give her a second. If she drops out, then she'll probably have to come back. But I don't know if anybody else experienced what I was experiencing, but I, I, I will tell you that there's these beautiful trees that live on my block and when I walk by them, I always greet them. And that's like part of my every day as I walk up and down the street, I greet them. And uh, and just that, you know, I'm, I'm as we're talking, I'm sitting here trying to think of how I get out of this house and get back into a mud hut. That's what I'm thinking about, you know. When we talk about poverty, there are in fact people that have problems with starvation, but generally that is, because resources have been stripped from them, you know. And, and if there was a starvation like you had when we had the, the droughts in Ethiopia, that was very easily solvable. But it was the governments that prevented the aid coming in. It wasn't that the world, well, maybe not the world, but the humanitarians didn't want to help them, but that they were there. Oh, she dropped out again. So... Um, yeah, so th that's always, you know, everything in this world is manageable. 
the one thing that may not be manageable is things like tsunamis and you just, you know, need to get out of the way. Go ahead, Trinity. I'll let you come back in because I was just talking to you while you came back. I'm sorry. Um, how much did you hear what I said? <laughs> you dropped out after thank you. <laughs> Oh. Um, I can't hear you, Karen. I said you dropped out after said, thank you. you. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I was wondering, the Sophia brought in the feminine aspects of nature and the earth and all things on it. And I understand the creatives having masculine and feminine characteristics. Uh, who, from your understanding, brought in the masculine qualities? If Sophia brought in the feminine, or did she bring in both? Okay, um, all of all aeons are androgynous, but they're androgynous just like we we are androgynous. We're just not physically androgynous. But if if the person when I when I meditate when I do shamanic journey or whatever i'm doing that i'm not really gender aware i'm androgynous i'm what my spirit is mm -hmm. um so all so but okay so sophia's male counterpart is thelate or she is coupled with intention mm -hmm. um so i mean so that's kind of that's that pairing um, of her quality, like in other words, her her quality, her male quality in her in the greater creation, because the understanding that we have from Gnostic shamans, and this goes, you know, as far as our galactic history, is that the aeons emanate in syzygies or dyads. In other, in other words, mm -hmm. imagine the originator kind of birthing yin yang symbols each emanation being a unique yin yang type of arrangement so in the in the yin yang syzygy um of sophia the the male gendered counterpart would be intention just i mean again so it would be wisdom and intention or if we're going to use greek terminology sophia and thelate thank you thank you and, and another, another question for me so, so I channel a Mad, why don't you, yeah, okay, go ahead. Oh, okay. Go ahead. It's okay now? Thank you. So I channel a Naga, and he always brings people back to the earth and to their sacral chakra and their root chakra to, for grounding and clearing and things like that. And I often feel like, um, I don't know how to describe this, but... It's often not what people are expecting or want to hear, but this is like his main focus. And when you were sharing about um, the importance of just being back in the earth, connecting to earth, then it's um, it's more of a comfort to me. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you about the Naga people. Have you met them? Um, are they part of the whole? Oh wait, she froze again. Um, she's asking about the Nagas. She channels the Nagas, and and they are all always calling back. I would, you know, the thing is, I don't know. It's important if you've met them or not, or if you know them or know of them, if they fall into your tradition. But I can imagine that <clears throat> within our system, there are many beings of many different origins. But if they have, if they have, and have lived on this earth in harmony with it, then their wisdom would be to send you back to that. To that. Oh, yeah, I, the Naga. Um, I mean, I'm aware of the Naga concept, and I'm I'm certainly comfortable. I mean, there are different ways. Certain times, the Nagas are kind of uh, depending on who's depicting them. Because you have to realize, we there really are two cosmologies, and the villains of one cosmology are are the heroes of another cosmology. Um, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of name calling going on. 
Um, but the Nagas, um, I mean, when I think of like, you know, the, uh, one of the manifestations of, of, of Mother Earth um, in the Amazonian forest, if you take ayahuasca in the Amazonian forest, almost invariably you will meet this huge snake that they call Panchamama. And um, very much an embodiment of the Amazon. Um, but th this snake is really quite um, of a sacred symbol um, in the wisdom traditions. Um, it's very much tied in with even the concept of the coiled Kundalini energy and, and the expression of that energy through the chakras done correctly um, will result in, I would think actually could result in the Anthropos 11, so to speak. Um, you know, a fully a fully activated chakra system would uh, um, would produce a profoundly different human animal. Um, so I mean, I feel that, and I like. I mean, I have since she's channeling the nagas and she's talking about how she, they're always bringing them back, bringing them back down to the root, and the sacral chakra makes perfect sense to me, um, because that would be their kind of their agency. Um, of you know, especially tying in with the the Kundalini um, metaphor or symbology, and it, it really it to for us to rise to higher higher states of consciousness. Let's call it, let's say fifth dimensional, which to me is a hard informed will. We have to have the more animal part of us cleared and integrated first. And so it is through understanding our, our very first awareness of being alive and connected on this earth that comes through the root chakra. The root chakra is I am. Um, and it's the, the basic awareness of, of safe and fed. There's, like, there's no emotion yet. This is all about the basics. Like I call it the amoebic mind. The same concerns that an amoeba has are the same basic same concerns that would be the consciousness of the first chakra. <clears throat> and then we, once we go into the sacral chakra, now we're starting to get into feeling stages. Now we're starting to not just know safe, cold, warm, hungry. We now add a dimension of how we feel about being safe, warm, hungry. You know, this, this is the um, this is the emotional component. This is where the richness starts to come in. Um, this is where also this, the feeling of being happy that we're warm can come, rather than just being warm. And then once and then once we have that once we and then from the feelings we go into the third chakra, where is where we kind of have this intellect or this logic that allows us to to take feelings and start to put them into abstract forms. You know what I mean? Where we can actually put, create thought things that we can have feelings about. In, other words, in the first two things, we're reacting to what is in the physical environment. And then once we add a mental dimension, we now start abstracting. And from those abstractings, we also now will have feelings about what we think. We, you know, take an idea, like, you know, if we go from simple survival to like, Oh, maybe I should do this in the future. And then we have the second chakra to tell us how we feel. Does it feel good? The first chakra will tell us, no, good, bad idea. You know, there's all these this integration of these levels of our consciousness. And it isn't until we have those settled, until we have those basic three chakras and a, and a really good communication from our very existence to starting to abstract about our existence that we can then start moving into wisdom, into the heart chakra. But we, to move into the heart chakra, to move into wisdom, we have to know ourselves, know thyself. And the, 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 the animal part of knowing ourselves, which is a crucial part to the spirit that's inhabiting the animal, is to get those first three chakras in alignment with each other, to understand how they work. And my understanding, especially what you're sharing with me, the Nagas are, that is how they prepare us for wisdom. By, ha by us getting that part of ourselves managed properly, getting the animal, the very animal part of ourselves managed and into its high performance. From there, we can reach into wisdom. From once we're wise, then we want to reach into our higher will and do, and do wise things with it.
I'll, I'll just say this, that um, I had a wonderful teacher in school. I was a theater major and he taught art history, but, you know, he said, one of the things he said is that no society can ever thrive until everyone's basic needs are met. And that, that was, that's, that's, that stayed with me so deeply, especially in, in the study of Hinduism where service is such an important thing and service to humanity is not just about doing something to make yourself feel better because you're helping someone poor, you know, or what we would consider poor or unfed, but it's, it's, I understood it from the idea of if we want society in our earth to be thriving in the most beautiful way, if we want creativity to thrive, if we want ourselves to thrive, we have to be on equal footing. And so the service of humanity is not about serving just so you can feed a starving person, but it's just serving humanity so that at one moment we can bring each other up so that we can all thrive. And, and to, to try to, and I always try to look at it and, and what my inner knowing told me is that life isn't about your, only your immediate impact that you have that you're walking around with, but it's about the longevity of the impact. You know, we, if we, if we really believe that we're these eternal beings and we come back and we come back, and even if you don't believe it, we do know that what we do now affects the future. So if the job right now, the need to serve each other is so that we can lift each other all up so that we can be on that, you know, equal footing. And, 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 you're, and you're saying it in a different way of, well, we maybe don't need to lift each other up, but we need to go back to our truer selves. But we do need to let go of this idea of you don't have anything, you can't have any opportunity, you know, and, and the stealing of resources from each other and the, the need to, you know, segregate everybody into these little pods needs to, needs to go away. But until our basic needs, and when I say ours, I mean everyone's basic needs are met. There is no gnosis for, for, the, for the whole organism because we are one organism, right? <laughs> so when, you know, it, when my brother is laying there dying from lack of food and food is so, so bountiful, then we can't go forward until we take care of each other. And that is the basic of part of living in harmony, of being aware of each other and being in agreement with each other and thriving together as one, as opposed to I have this and you can't have it. And don't cross my borders and don't, you know, do all these things. So yeah, we're at the top of the hour. Now we've been going two hours. I don't know if you want to continue or if you're ready. This is generally where we end the show, but I will say that if if you want to take one more question and sort of make a sort of maybe better to take a sort of make a closing statement or a final thoughts, I think that would be beautiful if you would do that. Well, I saw um, some. There's a few people who still have things to say, so I'm I'm good. Okay, Trinity, do you have some more? Did you want to say something else? Uh, yes, I, I just, forgive me, my internet is going in and out. It's very annoying for everybody. You're muted, Karen. I was going to say, does anyone, she's frozen again, unfortunately. Um, did anyone else in the chat have anything they wanted to state and or add? No? Earthing. Oh, 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 Christine would like you to talk about earthing. Not, nothing in the chat. Okay, thanks, Don. Christine would like you to talk about earthing. Okay. Hugely important. Um, I spend as much time, I'm, I'm barefoot as we speak. Um, I, I, although occasionally I put, during the winter, I put my slippers on because getting cold feet don't work for me. 
but um <clears throat> you know we have we have there's all kinds of minor chakras in our body and you know the palms of our hands and, and our souls also have uh portals you know kind of chakras and um to be connected to the earth through our feet cannot be overstated for health balance and also for communicate i feel there's <laughs> enhanced communication with the earth by especially when you you know when when you realize my naked feet are on her on her i mean when i step out on my lawn and 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 i'm and i i'm really conscious and i enter the dreaming and i can and i feel that grass on my feet and then the earth beneath that and knowing what's underneath there and um and just allow knowing that any of the anxiety or toxicity me in me can be pulled out into the earth to be processed and at the same time i can fill myself and refresh myself with wisdom um with you know with her her chi so to speak and um and so we, it's it, earthing but earthing is that's one concept and that's kind of you know, that earthing but there's also this the you know the to me earthing is living on the earth to acknowledging acknowledging the you know at least minimally you know the four basic elementals you know earth fire water and air um you know there's you know there's certain fire modern life is very dependent on fire and the technologies of fire and almost all myths have some kind of transmission of the technology or the invocation of fire that allowed us and i really feel that you know even i mean i like when i light my incense i have to use you know sometimes i have a candle but sometimes i use a lighter i always thank fire for allowing me to light the incense there's there is you know fire is a is one of the manifestations uh, is a manifestation of consciousness in a unique kind of band so one of the ways we can earth ourselves is is by honoring elements the elementals um and you don't have to do it you know you don't have to be pedantic about it or obsessive but the more we do it the more we do it the the the, the more earthed we get because earthing is really about connecting with the hologram of the earth. It isn't just about barefoot and connecting and going out to nature. True earthing things, probably the most powerful, but ancillary and also participatory when we're not doing that. In, in your house, while you're kindling an incense, you can be thankful of the of the element of fire for kindling it and at the same time knowing as you're lighting the incense that this is a sacrament you know this is something that the air spirits because it's carried in air so air spirits like incense so there's an air elemental thing there if you have an altar like i do you have some stones i have a little thing that contains water i can also swipe sweep the incense and acknowledge the spirit of water and the spirit of the earth so to me, a big part of earthing is to live within its milieu, both natural and supernatural. And supernatural is almost like a, a word that I think that sometimes separates us from natural. Super is the word above. And so basically it's a stacking. So we have, a th we have, a, we have what we call natural, which is really our uh, five dimensional sense apprehension abilities. And then we have that goes above that or what's above that perception level and that above that perception level or what's above the natural world is what's supernatural but it's all a continuum and so for me earthing is to step into the continuum right from our earth being on the feet to the to the elementals and you know that that are constantly around us if you're outside you know the like what you do karen acknowledging the spirits of trees um you know like i have some roses and there are flowers i i i i get down on my knees to smell flowers i acknowledge the sense i even send my like when i'm if i make a banana smoothie i often my way of blessing my way of blessing my food is asking sophia 
to not only bless it, but to enjoy it with me. In other words, as an extension, I now I have the taste buds. I have I have the equipment that's going to take this delicious banana that between her putting it on there and us engineering because the natural banana isn't like the banana we eat now. So it's a cope is again it's a it's a cooperative thing. So this fruit, this banana, this exquisite scent, this exquisite flavor, when I'm putting it, taking in his nutrition, I'm also using the sense buds that are part of my greater consciousness that feeds back into creative consciousness to realize I am a God, you know, form of God of divinity in, in a body, part of the divinity that created what I'm about to taste and to creating a feedback loop of taking that taste and sending it back to the creator of the concept or even the holder of the holographic concept of the banana where, you know, is it, so does this kind of kind of creating constant loops between the creator, the created, the one that like, you know, the, the scent of a rose, I mean, the consciousness that created the scent of a rose to me gets to smell it through my nose, through your nose, through our noses. This is how we feed it back. This is job well done. This is confirmation that it's good. And it was good. That's beautiful. It's it goes down to what we talk about about that the that that all that is is wants to experience and experiencing can also be relishing and and you know that's the being in the moment the mindfulness of it to to appreciate and to to really experience things and not take them really for granted but to 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 really experience the wonder of the alchemy of the banana and how when it goes into your body it becomes part of you it it, it magically feeds you and supports your system and gives you nutrients and allows you to continue and and what is that i mean how that's magic really you know some people say that's biology but potato potato you know but it's the it's, wonderment of of earth really and and being and we don't pay enough attention to that i think I, I realize what I kind of beat around the bush. A big part of earthing is being sensual. And again, by sensual, the flavor of a banana, the scent of a rose, the caress of a breeze, the, you know, the feeling of the sun. This is sensual. This is pure primal animal sensuality without all of the eroticism and getting lost in that stuff. And so for me, the earthing is to get sensual again. So that's one of the reasons you'd be barefoot. So you, it's not just barefoot on the ground. Can you feel the texture, the difference texture of a grass before rain, after rain, when it's dry? I mean, the textures. I mean, you know, the, the, the buoyancy of the earth, you know, how hard is it? How soft? How yielding? Did a mole build something? Oh, it's a little cushy here. Um, that, just that, that, to me, that is so much earthing is to just allow the senses that come with our animal body to apprehend the beauty of creation. The sensuality of creation. Just experiencing it all. Thank you for that. Um, I think if we can, maybe we can end with like we began, but with a blessing and maybe a reminder of, of Earthing as a is a prayer for all of us to to go and experience our great host, our creator, a creation, and 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 our part in it. Maybe that would be a good way to to end today. Well, I'd like somebody else to do it. <laughs> okay. Would anyone like to do a blessing? That's in the chat. I'll I'll do a light language. I'll do a light language if anyone else wants to do one. Um, my light language, I think, is very earthy. It's more, it's more is very, uh, yeah. beautiful. I love it. Okay. Okay. Let me sit up so I can move the mic thing to me. Okay. All right. I'm cold. I'm hot. I'm hot. I'm cold. <laughs> so, like you in your socks. All right. Shali Aramba Santi Karamalaria, T 
ti saria peluria, ki tambo, da foria shala, kasia mando, mi akaloria pasi, shalia de santi, i apa ku mayalaria, doria madigarasi, ni fanda, loria pata, kashiala masiati, i kafonia mini, choria pasata, lahia rakasima no, le suya piketina, no mi akalara mani. I salamia sakatandu mo mia la sia sha ya kia bloria mani la lina masi ni gadu mania i kaliera pasholi amasia komia ya sia shalala ko pantia mande loli amasi i sha pupu i pia la kia mbade ni la ke sia mandoria a shia la so mia matikasha ni ya kapatala di amasholi amasala ni ya sulmania Shi ala korsina mania ko pashi laria kasi du piando malia kasa shandi 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 no oh, I was beautiful <laughs> thank you thank you that was very nice thank you thank you so so everyone thank you so much for being here the the biggest heartfelt thank you i think it's really nice to sometimes take a break from the channeling and have sort of wisdom talks with those that are wise uh, to bring them on because we have a lot of belief systems and it's very interesting to have someone who has such a grounded and and beautiful harmonious uh way of communicating so thank you for sharing your your wisdom with us and uh, yeah. You're welcome back anytime. And everyone, please go to uh, Rad's channel. There is a card that if you click it, it'll say where it is. Subscribe to his channel uh, and you can hear more of his talks and his perspective on life on planet Earth. Yeah. Somebody yeah. just put, you're a wonderful guide for us, Karen, and I would agree with them. Oh, um, I was, can I just comment a bit on your language? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I am a little bit of a language geek as far as the f sounds of them, and some etym certainly etymology. And there is there is a sound that's in especially the English language, but also in Latin, and it is the sound it is the sound that I did not hear once in your language, and I wasn't surprised it wasn't there. And that is the vowel sound, uh. You know, like like that we get in words like numb and dumb and hum, um, and huh and duh. Um, there's a deadness to it. Even I mean, in Latin, the Latin word for lead is plumbum. So there's so I, I and so one of the things I noticed that was so lacking and so beautiful and uplifting about your language is the the there is none the vowels are all like an a ah, e ah, o or u and you know they don't and that's the other you know that the uh, the other thing is there are certain sounds that are sacred and there are certain sounds that are not sacred and uh is not a sacred sound. You wouldn't create this. I mean, the word uh conveys information, but it isn't it's an information that need that is basically there's an error and there needs to be some correction. That's funny. That's funny. I mean it's true. I mean, it's true. But it's funny. And I, what an interesting observation to to hear that. So I always think of it being very earthy, feels very uh yeah, kind of elfy or Elven, Elven. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Elder race, I would call it. Mm. Kind of. Yeah. Does anyone yeah, else does anyone want to share their language? Does anyone else want to? Before we go? The other day we were um, we were playing after the webinar and I was singing in a in a language. And I thought I would just do that real quick. Just yeah. Let me see. Find a 
Joyan Mali Karamani Dayan Ia Pushoko Malia Dibanaro Shikapa Polia Siamuna Ibarare Seria Paria Malika Noma Haria Se Parika Bavarina Hari apa say, hari apa karma? Oh ya manana, kamu dia ma, he panapa sya, dia ramana, he ya pudu, jika manana. He ya minana, she ya pukuma. He ya puku. Dia pukuma, hiya puku, dia menuma. Hari ya, a little blue. Ah, that was great. Yeah, yeah. So it's just if anyone wants to play it, it was just a sort of blues progression, but not really a little bit out of out of uh, things. So in the G chord, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's fun. Thank I you. wish I wish we had the ability to accompany each other, you know, no. without, without the, the but, but technology. technology not connect. I mean, I have a guitar sitting behind me and a bass to the side of me. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> do you speak a light language? I do not. Okay. okay. Well, let's say I've never attempted to. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's kind of like where I'll say I've never attempted to, so I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it comes up for some people. Uh, it just comes up. You know, I, I was, I, I think I was sharing this, that there was a, when I was in India, we were doing a meditation and this girl had never spoke a light language. She didn't even know what one was, but she was so deep in meditation. It just came pouring out. And I think, you know, you can activate it if you want to, if you really want it, you can activate it and ask for it. And it just comes out in the beginning as sort of the gibberish you know, of making sounds, but eventually just sort of allowing those sounds to come out and sort of with the trust that, um, yeah, that, that whatever you're saying is what your soul is saying and, and what needs to be said and allowing, you know, you just, you don't, you, what's interesting is you never really hear an angry light language, you know, you never hear someone go, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is, I think, is an indicator that our soul is not angry or anything like that, that our soul is always speaking to us, guiding us. And even if we don't, we don't understand it on, on, the, on what every sound or utterance means, but on a vibrational level, it's doing something to us, activating us in some way that's beneficial for us. So, And for maybe those that are hearing it as well. Well, it certainly has passion, and I like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, although, but again, it's it's a, a good wholesome passion, and um, it's so clear, at least when you're speaking it, that it's language. It has it has a cadence. Um, it has a melody. Um, it has, and and again, there whatever is being said rises and falls in intensities based on what's being said. Like I said, there's a passion that can be recorded from it. Um, it's very dynamic, um, something gibberish wouldn't be. No, I'm just thinking the activation of it, you know, sometimes it's like the same thing with channeling. When people first start channeling, there's a, when you, when you first start channeling, it's, it's always about getting out of the way of allowing something to flow through you, whether you would say it is a world of knowledge or just information you're getting. But the more uh, you flow, the easier it comes through, the more, the less there is of your own filter and the more um, 
pure with for lack of a better word the information is because it's not like coming through karen's opinion or somebody's opinion it's more what is it that's being said and i think it's very much the same with the light language that you're just allowing the sounds without having a forethought about having sort of any kind of uh, trepidation or uh, fear about what you're saying or how it's being said or how it sounds just trusting it you know so but they're asking in the chat if you want to play something <laughs> too early for me just to tell everyone this is in fact the middle of his night even though it's the middle of our day he's a night guy so maybe maybe if you look him up on his channel in about six or seven hours he'll be, he'll be ready so we did wake him up uh to uh to come on so i really appreciate it it's been a wonderful conversation and uh I appreciate everyone for being here and, and hanging out. And um, again, I'll give you one last chance. If you have any questions, one last question, we can do it, or else we're gonna we're gonna let him go and uh, have some breakfast. Where is he? Where is he from? I live in Southwest Virginia. I'm about a, an hour north of the North Carolina border, un tucked underneath West Virginia. Okay. Okay. Beautiful place. Um, it's it's actually a place that that Casey mentioned in his readings when when there supposedly was going to be a lot of turbulence in the earth in the nineties. This area of Virginia was declared a safe place, and I can, you can tell. And it's got white quartzite stone everywhere. Like when you go past meadows, the boulders that stick out of the ground are white quartzite. It's really quite a and all and all the the water's really good here all the water flows into our county none all of it flows out so as long as we keep our water clean our water will always be clean because no other dirty water can come into our into our water basins okay well thank you all it's been it's really been very very uh good energy i guess i could say you're muted Karen. blessings to you you're still muted. still muted i'm still muted i said oh we're a good group over here at human colony you know <laughs> i will say this that the human colony when we first when it first started it was really about the idea of a, of a colony of humans going out into space. Um, but I've sort of, in my mind, adopted a different belief system about what human colony is. I believe that we are the human colony here and that we need to learn to take care of this place and this self and ourselves and the people on this earth and, and you know, master one before we go running off into another one. You know, we need to be we need to be as ecological and in harmony as po as much as possible before we go out to another place and you know start doing that over there. So, but we're one human colony, and we're all in it. So, so, I like I want I love being involved with the intelligence of this earth. Mm -hmm. There is so much richness right here. And when we when we reach our sagacious stage, or you know, we'll call the the Anthropos Eleven, we will be multidimensional. We won't. We'll be able to interact with the rest of the galaxy in um, non-technological ways. Is my opinion. Um, and and so and when we have that capacity to do galactic outreach, we not only will we be ready. But they'll be ready for us. You're muted. Once again, I'm gonna. <laughs> I want to. I want to end it here because we could go on. He. We have. A, we have a, a little pattern of of long conversations, so this could go on and on. But just in the top corner on the video, there's a little eye, and if you click that eye then a card comes up with a link to your channel. So please subscribe to, to Maude's channel. And then also, if you've never subscribed to Human Colony, please click
click the subscribe button just so that anytime we bring something out, you'll get a little ping notification, you know, until the telepathy thing kicks in. Why don't you, why don't you subscribe to the channel? Um, next week, we're going to uh, have Jim back. And so we will see everybody next week and much love to everyone and go out and breathe the air, walk on the earth, say hello to the elements. If we've learned anything today, that's what we learned that we should do. So be kind to each other and much love.